Hello, my name is Andrew Norton. I'm in the School of Physical Sciences at the Open University and today I'm going to give another talk about an area of astrophysics that I work on. So let me just share my slides. So the talk that I'm going to give is called Outbursts, Orbits and Oscillations. It's all about the time domain astrophysics of compact accreting binary stars and I'll explain just what that means uh, shortly but basically I'm going to be talking about white dwarfs and neutron stars and black holes and many of the images such as the one I've got on screen here are by a very talented space artist called Mark Garlick and I would encourage you to take a look at his website uh, spaceart.co.uk uh, if you want to see more of this sort of thing. So let's think about uh, how we do astronomy then. Um, in general terms when we're trying to study objects out there in space all we have to go on is the light that they emit and that we detect here on Earth. Now, when I say light, I might mean any part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and I'll come on to that shortly. But the simplest thing we tend to think of is images, such as the ones shown here. Uh, the images I've got, these are all, um, I think these are all Hubble Space Telescope images. So at the top, we've got a, a supernova remnant and a so-called planetary nebula. And at the bottom, we've got a, a star cluster and a star forming region. Now these extended objects are all well and good and by examining the structure we can understand a great deal about what's going on in these regions of space from the, uh, the, the distribution of the material, its colors tell us something about the temperature or the composition and so on. But often uh, what we have to deal with in astronomy are just a point source of light, a star. Uh, for most stars they're so far away we can't resolve them into anything like a, a an extended disk we just see a point of light so we have to study these points of light uh, in a different way and the ways we can do that are by looking at the spectrum of the light how it's distributed with wavelength or frequency and we can look at the time series of that light how the brightness if you like varies with time and that's going to be a particular focus of some of the things that I'm going to talk about in this talk so I'll start off by talking about compact objects and what we mean by that and the modes of accretion, how these compact objects accrete material, accumulate material from a companion star in a binary system. I'll then talk about various categories of objects, novae and bursters. I'll talk about dwarf novae and soft transients, soft X-ray transients, sorry. Uh, and I'll talk about uh, things called intermediate polars and X-ray pulsars. Now I'll explain all of these uh, as we go along. So first of all then, let's think about these compact objects, white dwarfs, neutron stars and black holes. These are the end points in the evolution of stars. So a star like the Sun will end its life as a white dwarf. A star that starts off with a mass maybe 10 times that of the Sun, when it ends its life it will turn into a neutron star and the very ma most massive stars will end their lives collapsing to become black holes. So when we see these stellar mass compact objects, uh, out there in, in, in the galaxy, we see white dwarfs with masses up to about 1.4 times the mass of the Sun. That mass limit is called the Chandrasekhar limit. Uh, a, a white dwarf any more massive than that would collapse on itself and in fact turn into a neutron star. The upper limit for the mass of a neutron star is round about two and a half solar masses. We don't know precisely what that value is, but it's uh, a limit known as the Oppenheimer-Volkoff limit. And compact objects more massive than that uh, have no other way of existing other than as a black hole. Now you may wonder why these masses don't quite mass what I said a moment ago about the types of stars that turn into these objects. That's because during their, their death throes, if you like, stars expel a large amount of mass. So even though a star may have six, seven, eight times the mass of the sun to begin with, as it dies, it sheds a lot of that mass and collapses down to become a white dwarf less than the mass of the sun typically. Now when we talk about the radii, the sizes of these compact objects, you can see they really are very small indeed. That's why we call them compact objects. White dwarfs typically have a radius similar to that of the Earth. And as shown in the little graph at the top, you can see that uh, more massive white dwarfs actually have smaller radii. That's a bit counterintuitive, but that's just the way this uh, material that white dwarfs are made of, known as electron, electron degenerate material, the way that it behaves. Similarly, neutron stars are also slightly smaller as they get rather more massive. Uh, they're supported by something called neutron degeneracy pressure, but they typically all have radii round about 10 
kilometers. The radii of these compact uh, black holes, stellar mass black holes, are also around about 10 kilometers. Broadly speaking, uh, a black hole with a mass equal to that of the sun, one solar mass would have a radius of about three kilometers. Something three times as massive would have a radius of about nine or 10 kilometers. That sort, of, uh, that sort of size. So you can see these are very small objects indeed compared to regular stars. Now, in binary stars, where these compact objects are accreting from a companion, there are broadly speaking two ways in which they can do that. And here's a diagram of one of these modes of accretion. The compact object is uh, the white object sitting over here in the center of this uh, so-called accretion disk, which is a flattened, swirling amount of material that uh, is transferred from the companion star, swirls around the, uh, the compact object before accreting onto it. The companion star itself, shown on the left, is this object that's distorted into a sort of pear shape by the extremely strong gravity of the compact object. And when material on this companion star reaches this uh, so-called inner Lagrangian point, the, the the point of the pear shape, if you like, it can be transferred down onto the compact object through a stream and an accretion disk, as, as you see here. This mode of accretion then is known as Roche lobe overflow and tends to occur when we, when we have a, a relatively low mass companion star to the compact object, something that's comparable to the sun or perhaps even less massive than that. The other mode of accretion is shown in this uh, nice image, and this is wind accretion, sometimes called bondi hoyle accretion, where we have a giant companion star that has a really strong stellar wind. And as the compact object, perhaps in this case a neutron star, orbits around this, uh, this giant star, it can sweep up some of that wind and again accrete it down onto its surface. Now, in what follows, I'm going to be talking about uh, different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. I'll, I'll principally be talking about visible, that's optical light, the, the light that uh, we, we detect with our, with our eyes. And as you can see from this diagram of the electromagnetic spectrum, visible light just occupies a very narrow region, a very small range of wavelengths or frequencies round about the middle of this whole spectrum. At Longer wavelengths, we have the infrared, microwave, and radio wave regions. And at shorter wavelengths or higher frequencies, we have the ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma ray regions. And in what follows, I'm going to be talking particularly about X-ray emission from these compact interacting binary stars. Because in the extreme gravitational fields, the extreme temperature environments of these systems, uh, the material is hot enough that it emits x-rays and that's then how we can study them by looking at the x-rays they emit which we detect uh, here with uh, x-ray telescopes which are usually on satellites in orbit around the earth. What I'm going to show you now is a movie of the x-ray sky. So this is a movie that was compiled with a satellite called the x-ray timing explorer in the late 1990s. Um, this is a schematic map then of, of the sky in galactic coordinates. So the plane of the galaxy runs across the middle of the image. The center of our galaxy is in the middle. And the little colored circles are different sources of x-rays, x-ray stars. The size of the circle just indicates the brightness in x-rays, how, how many x-rays we detect from them. And the color is an indication of the temperature uh, hotter temperature objects are shown in a bluer color, cooler objects in a, in a redder color. And you can see various uh, objects are identified here in this diagram. The movie will start shortly. Um, at the bottom of the map is a zoom in on the very central regions of our galaxy where many of these objects are much, much closer together. Uh, and so we've just done a zoom in there at the bottom so that you can pick them out. So here we go then. The movie is just about to start any moment now. Here we go. So you see the clock ticking away in the upper right. So it, I think it's four days of real time for every second of the movie. And you can see that the X-ray sky is a very dynamic place. These X-ray sources are flaring up, fading away, getting brighter and fainter, changing temperature maybe uh, as they do so. Um, they remain in the same place, of course, because they're relatively fixed within the galaxy compared to uh, the position of our solar system. Uh, the, the moving spot on this map, which has just disappeared off one side and, and just appeared on the other side, is the position of the sun in the sky. Of course, the sun isn't really moving. It's, 
the earth moving around the sun that uh, causes the sun to appear projected against a different part of the sky. But you can see then these various X-ray sources across our galaxy flaring up and fading away uh, as time progresses and different ones are identified. Many of these X-ray sources are just identified by um, a sort of their coordinates, these numerical names, but uh, others such as the one that's just popped up there, SMCX1, that's an X-ray source in the small Magellanic Cloud, one of the sat satellite galaxies uh, associated with our Milky Way. You can see uh, various of these objects pop up and, and get labelled. Many of them, uh, it turns out, have neutron stars uh, as part of the, their composition. Some of them have black holes. You can see that some of these are labelled as recurrent transients or recurrent nova. I'll explain just what these are uh, as we go along in the later parts of this talk. Okay, I think you've probably got the, uh, the idea of that now, so I will move on to my next slide. To give you an idea of the scale of these so-called X-ray binary uh, stars, the diagram here shows that. So at the top of the diagram is, a, is an arrow showing the distance from the Sun to Mercury. So that's uh, the scale of our solar system, or the inner parts of our solar system, if you like, uh, and with the Sun drawn to scale as well. So you can see that in many of these systems that go by various names here, LMCX3, LMCX1, V1357 Cygni, and so on, the companion star, the, the donor star in the binary, is rather bigger than the Sun. Uh, in some of the others, like this one down at the bottom, V518 Persei, for instance, the donor star is rather smaller than the Sun. But nonetheless, the, the scale of the system, the distance between the, the accretion disk and the donor star, is very compact. They would all fit in between the Sun and Mercury uh, in our solar system. And some of these smaller ones would even fit uh, sort of in between the Earth and the Moon, perhaps. They're very compact, very close binaries. And so uh, they tend to have orbital periods, the two stars orbiting around each other, which are measured in days or even hours in some cases. So they're very compact systems, and that's important to remember. So there's a huge range of these different types of compact binary stars, and I've attempted to uh, describe them here in this taxonomy chart. Now, don't worry about the details of this. I'm going to look at some of the specific objects as we go through. But broadly speaking, the ones in red are systems where we have a white dwarf. The systems in yellow are ones we have a neutron, where we have a neutron star. And the systems in blue are the ones where we have a black hole that's accreting material. So if I start then with one of the red ones, one of the white dwarf systems, and this is a type of system known as NOVI. So NOVI look something like this. They have a, a, a system where a small, low-mass red dwarf star is distorted into this sort of pear shape, and is, its material from it is being drawn down onto a white dwarf, which sits down here at the centre of this flattened accretion disk. So Nova outbursts then look something like this. This is the uh, light curve of uh, Nova Sagittarii 2012. So this is an object that uh, underwent an outburst in 2012, star in the constellation of Sagittarius. Um, and what we're plotting here is a graph showing just the brightness of the star as a function of time. And as you can see, this graph spans uh, about a, a week or so, a couple of weeks, and it rises in brightness fairly uh, rapidly and then fades away rather slowly. Okay, when we see these novae, uh, mostly we, we see them occur once and we never see them recur again. It's thought that some of them probably do recur, maybe most of them do recur, but on very long timescales, maybe thousands or even tens of thousands of years um, between these successive Nova outbursts, but they increase in brightness by a factor of maybe a thousand or ten thousand before fading away uh, gradually over time. If I now jump to another part of this taxonomic chart uh, in yellow here, one of these neutron star systems called uh, bursters, X ray bursters. So these are rather similar. Uh, again, a little image here showing what these may look like. The difference here is that we've got accretion from a companion star down onto a neutron star. And what we see here, uh, when we look at the x-rays from that system shown in the top graph, is a series of x-ray bursts. These are rapid bursts of x-rays that last just a few seconds and repeat 
every few hours. As you can see, this graph spend, uh, spans a few hours uh, over the course of a day, the 29th of January 2003, looking at this particular X-ray burster called 4U1323-62. And if we zoom in on just one of those X-ray bursts, happens to be from a different system, but the principle is the same. Uh, now in the lower graph, you can see we're spreading out the light from that burst uh, over maybe 200 seconds or so. You can see that they have a very characteristic shape again, a steep rise and then this shallow decay. So the bursts themselves last just a few minutes and recur every few hours. It turns out that both novae, in the case of accreting white dwarfs, and X-ray bursts, in the case of accreting neutron stars, have the same cause. And it's this shown here, it's a thermonuclear explosion on the surface of the white dwarf or neutron star. What happens is material from the companion star builds up on the surface of the compact star until it reaches a critical mass when thermonuclear runaway can occur, it goes bang, blows material off, and it starts accreting again. The difference is that in the white dwarfs, that uh, recurs every few thousand years, and the outburst is mostly seen as, a, as an optical, a visible light flash, whereas in the case of neutron stars, the burst recurs every few hours, and we see it um, in, in an X-ray uh, situation. We see X-rays from the system instead. But the principle behind both types is the same. One of the useful things with X-ray bursts is that they allow us to measure the size of neutron stars. Now, I've put a couple of equations here, but don't worry about that. I've not got many equations in this talk. This is just to illustrate that if we see an X-ray burst from a neutron star and we measure the flux of light, the, the, the amount of light we measure in, say, watts per square meter from that burst, and we measure the temperature of the spectrum of the X-rays, then we can combine those quantities to actually work out the radius of the neutron star, shown in the uh, third equation there. The radius of the neutron star just depends on the distance to the system, which we can get by other means. The flux that we measure from the burst, a constant sigma called the Stefan Boltzmann constant, and the temperature of the spectrum that we measure. And from measurements and calculations like this, we can then measure the radius of neutron stars to be this number of order 10 kilometers that I mentioned earlier. Back to the taxonomy chart again, if we look at another of the uh, white dwarf accretors, these are things called dwarf novae. Now they were named originally because they, they look like just uh, dimmer versions of novae. They occur in the same sort of systems where we've got accretion via a disc onto a white dwarf, but they recur much more frequently. Here's a light curve of a, a dwarf nova called SS Cygni over uh, a year or so from June 1992 to September 1993. And you can see that this object underwent, what, seven bursts plus a, another rather odd bit period of activity uh, over here, but seven bursts in this period of a year and a bit. Um, the increase in brightness is not as significant as with a nova, hence the name dwarf nova, it only increases by brightness by maybe a factor of 100 or so. The outbursts themselves last for weeks and recur every few months. Now, there's a similar type of object, it turns out, on the other side of this taxonomic diagram, uh, in terms of uh, black hole and neutron star systems that we call X-ray transients. In fact, they're usually called soft X-ray transients because the X-ray emission from them is quite low energy. So these then are due to accretion via a disk onto a neutron star or black hole. And the outbursts look like this. Here's the light curve in X-rays of a system called A0620-0. This is a plot of the X-ray brightness against time. And you can see that in this case, the outburst lasts for months and they actually recur every few years or even decades. It turns out that these then are the X-ray equivalent, the neutron star equivalent, the black hole equivalent of what happens in dwarf novae. And it's due to what's called a thermal viscous instability in the accretion disk. We can characterize the accretion disk by two numbers, the mass transfer rate, the rate at which material flows through the disk, and the density of the disk. And if we plot those quantities on a graph, we find that the physically allowed values lie on this green line, this sort of S curve that we see here. The upper and lower branches of this curve are both stable, but the middle branch is an unstable regime. 
and that's key to this uh, this process. So what happens is the system, the accreting white dwarf or neutron star or black hole with its accretion disk around it, can find itself in a situation where the mass transfer is somewhere in the region that would put it on this unstable branch of the uh, S-curve. It can't remain there, so what happens? Well, what happens is that matter accumulates in the disk. It heats up as it does so. So material flows into the disk from the companion star. It can't flow out of the disk quick enough, so it builds up in the disk the disk therefore gets hotter. It reaches a point where the disk can't move on to the unstable branch of this S curve. So instead it heats up rapidly, the hydrogen in the disk becomes ionized and the system goes into outburst. When it's on this then hot branch of the S curve, material can then flow out of the disk at a greater rate mass is passed down onto the compact object, the disk cools down, it reaches a point where it cools rapidly, the hydrogen deionizes, recombines, and the system falls into quiescence. So you can see that there's a cycle here going around this S-curve on the uh, graph of mass transfer rate against density, and that's how these systems cycle quasi-periodically quasi between a cool quiescent state and a hot outburst state. And that's what explains both dwarf novae, when the accretor is a white dwarf, and soft x-ray transients, when the accretor is a neutron star or black hole. So in these four types of systems that I've talked about then, we have two different types of compact objects and two different types of outburst mechanism. When the compact object is a white dwarf, we call these things cataclysmic variables, and when the compact object is a neutron star or black hole, we call them X-ray binaries. And the four types of systems that I've talked about, shown here then, dwarf nova, classical nova, soft X-ray transient, and X-ray burster, have this uh, characteristic duration for the different outbursts. Days and weeks in the terms of the duration of dwarf novae, tens of days for the duration of classical novae, fairly similar, months for the duration of soft X-ray transients, but seconds or minutes for the durations of X-ray bursters. If instead of the duration, we look at the recurrence interval, well, with dwarf novae, they recur every few months. With classical novae, they maybe recur every 10,000 years or so. Soft X-ray transients recur every few decades. X-ray bursters recur every few hours. There's one point I didn't mention earlier, of course. I've said X-ray binaries have either a neutron star or a black hole, but X-ray bursters are not seen in the black hole systems. And the reason for that is simply that black holes don't have a physical surface on which the material can accumulate in order to undergo the thermonuclear runaway. So if we see an X-ray burster, we know it must be a neutron star uh, compact object and not a black hole. Conversely, the soft X-ray transients can occur in either type of system, neutron star or black hole, because that outburst is occurring in the disk which is independent of the uh, compact object in the center of it. Now, back to my taxonomy diagram again, I'm going to talk about a couple more types of objects. Over on the right-hand side with the red systems, the white dwarf systems, I'm going to talk about some systems called intermediate polars. Now, these are systems where the white dwarf has a strong magnetic field, and as such, it's able to disrupt the inner regions of the uh, accretion disk, as shown here in this cartoon. You can see that the accretion disk is truncated at some radius where material latches onto the field lines of, of the white dwarf and is then channeled down to the magnetic poles of the white dwarf which is the little blue object you can see there spinning at the center of the accretion disk. So in these systems when we look at the x-rays coming from close in to the white dwarf itself and here's the x-ray light curve of uh, a system called AO Piscium the light curve spans about 16 hours we can see a clear pulsation in the x-rays uh, every 15 minutes or so, and that's the rate at which the white dwarf is spinning. But we can also see a longer modulation uh, every few hours, and that represents the orbital period at which the two uh, objects, the white dwarf and the companion star, are orbiting around each other. So we see, if you like, two clocks in the system here, the spinning white dwarf and the orbiting binary. If I move now to the other side of the taxonomy diagram and look at some of these things called X-ray pulsars, these are systems with, uh, again, a, a neutron star in them, but these are now magnetic uh, neutron stars, very magnetic neutron stars. 
we see here what are called X-ray pulsars. And there's a little image there showing what one of these may look like from the uh, surface of a, of a handy nearby asteroid that we're standing on. What happens here is that the magnetic field of the neutron star, the X-ray pulsar, is able to funnel, again, material from maybe the wind of its companion star down onto the magnetic poles of the neutron star. And as it spins on its axis, so this beam of X-rays passes by our line of sight. So here's a particular X-ray pulsar called Vela X1, uh, consists of a neutron star and a, and a giant star. The X-ray light curve is shown there on the left, and we see a regular pulsation going on. If we uh, extract that pulsation, if you like, fold the light curve over on itself every uh, 283 seconds in this case, which is the rate at which the neutron star is spinning, we see the uh, X-ray pulsation there going up and down as first one beam from a pole of the neutron star and then the other beam from the other pole sweeps across our line of sight. In this system, the orbital period is about nine days, so that's the time it takes the two stars to orbit around each other. One thing we can do is measure the speed at which that X-ray pulsar is orbiting its companion star. And we do that using the Doppler effect. As this X-ray pulsar is moving away from us, so the pulses, these 283 second pulses, arrive more slowly as the neutron star moves away from us. As it's coming towards us in the orbit, the 283 second pulses arrive more quickly. So if we measure that time delay, advanced and retarded as the neutron star orbits, we can plot that delay as a curve and we see that it varies over the nine day orbit of the system. The amplitude of that graph then indicates how fast the neutron star is moving around its orbit and we can measure that. Now it's not just that the neutron star is orbiting around the, uh, the giant star, the two stars are orbiting around their common center of mass and we can measure the speed of the giant star by looking at its spectrum. Here's a segment of the spectrum of that uh, giant star in Vela X1. And you can see in this graph at the bottom, the various absorption lines in that part of the spectrum, ranging from uh, the blue end to the green part of the visible spectrum. And what we can do is measure the precise wavelengths of those spectral lines, because as the giant star is moving around in its orbit, so the Doppler shift comes into play again, as the star is moving away from us, so those spectral lines get shifted to longer wavelengths, and as the giant star is moving towards us, so those spectral lines get shifted to shorter wavelengths. We can convert those shifts into the speed at which the giant star is moving, and again, plot that uh, on a graph as shown here. So the giant star over the nine day orbit is alternately moving towards us and away from us uh, as the two stars orbit around their common center of mass. And essentially what we can do is then measure the speed of motion of the neutron star from the time delay of the pulsation, the speed of motion of the companion star from the Doppler shifts of its spectral lines. We measure the orbital period. In this case, the system also eclipses, that is the neutron star passes behind the giant star for about a tenth of each orbit, and we can use that to work out the angle at which we're viewing the system. If we put all that information together, we can actually weigh the two stars. And in this case, it turns out that the neutron star has a mass of about twice that of the sun, and the giant star has a mass of around about 30 times that of the sun. So that's a rapid whistle-stop tour then of these compact accreting binary stars. I think I've hopefully shown you that they undergo these outbursts. We can measure their oscillations and their orbits, and they allow us to study both extreme gravitational fields, extreme temperatures, and extreme magnetic fields in these systems. And they allow us to measure, amongst other things, the masses of compact objects and the sizes of compact objects too. I'll just uh, finish the slides there. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this talk and I hope you watch some more of the lectures on our website too.